Will you please welcome to Bananas tonight, Jeff Allen. <laughs> to be here in beautiful Columbus. I, uh, I live in Nashville, and I know I don't sound like I'm from Nashville, but I grew up on the north side of Nashville. <laughs> yeah, that, would, that would be Chicago. <laughs> and, uh, I flew in on Southwest Airlines, and I've never flown with A friend of mine gave me a ticket, and I figured out why. He was able to walk from Nashville and beat me by an hour. <laughs> so, how many stops can they make before it's reclassified a bus trip? That's what I want to know. <laughs> I think at one point we were in the middle of a cornfield picking two guys up waving 20s. I was just... <laughs> Man. It's a beautiful day today. Uh, actually, you know, the, uh, it's my favorite times of the year. I like it cool. And uh, I was in Arizona about a month and a half, two months ago. It was about a 112, 112. And they'll tell you it's a dry heat when you get there. You know that came from the Chamber of Commerce. <laughs> what can we say about the heat that won't turn the tourists off? Well, you want to keep the word volcanic out of that ad. <laughs> And my favorite was for a week, I heard, it doesn't feel 112, does it? No, it feels 285. <laughs> and there are medical benefits. I wasn't there two hours and the water on my knee evaporated, so I just got rid of, <laughs> rid of my limp. And I learned something laying by the pool. It's time to get inside when your eyebrows just burst into flames. <laughs> laying there, and, oh, that's it, kids. You, your daddy's smoldering. Got my wife screaming at me, put your sunscreen on. For what, basting? Let's get out of here. <laughs> Run for it, kids. God has abandoned this place. <laughs> I'll tell you, I'll take the heat over the cold. I was in North Dakota seven years ago, and I'm still talking about it. I am not kidding you. I believe we can give North Dakota to Canada. I don't think we'll miss it. I really don't. <laughs> It was 80 degrees below zero. Think about it. 80 degrees below zero. That means it can warm up 80 degrees in one day and still be zero. <laughs> yeah, get the storm windows off, honey. I'm boiling in here. It's, it's got to be zero out there. Whew. I'm going to get my Speedos in my wedge. <laughs> Why do thermometers even go to 80 below? You think at 40 below, the weatherman can just come out and go, woohoo, it's cold. <laughs> Back to you, Bob. <laughs> and I saw a guy jogging. I'm on my way to a club, I'm ready to go to work, it's nighttime, and this guy's out running the streets in 80 below zero weather. I have to tell you, never in my life have I had a stronger urge to run over another human being with my car. <laughs> And he would have thanked me. I know he would have. <laughs> He's got a problem. He just doesn't know how to deal with it. <laughs> I have never understood jogging. And believe me, I've tried it. I just wasn't very good. I'd run about a mile, I'd buy half a dozen donuts, and then walk home. <laughs> I ran every day for eight months, and I gained 41 pounds. <laughs> Man, that jogging will pack on the flab. So a friend of mine felt my problem with jogging was just lack of information. If I had more information, I would probably enjoy it more. He actually bought me a book on jogging. They write books on how to jog. How intellectually deprived do you have to be to not be able to figure out how to jog? Come on, are there people watching runners go by? How do they do that? There's got to be a book somewhere. <laughs> Where do you run into problems learning to jog? Oh, I'm skipping again. <laughs> you know, honey, there's a lot more to this jogging than meets the eye. <laughs> I'm going to go to Barnes and Nobles. So they fill this book, which is about that thick with things you'll never use, I mean, to fill a book. I mean, one whole chapter devoted to how to train for a marathon. 
I read the first line and went, yeah, like I'll ever live 26 miles from a donut shop. <laughs> and they had some information I use, and here's a little a, a tip if you're a runner, perhaps. What to do if you're ever out running and a dog chases you. Yeah, they tell you not to try to outrun the dog because the dog will catch you and bite you, so this is what you're supposed to do. You stop running, you turn around, you face the snarly beast, point your finger at him, so he knows you're talking to him. <laughs> yeah, you don't want any confusion out there. Armadillo could run by, then he got chaos. It's just... After you point, you stomp your foot, and then you yell, freeze! See, it's that loud voice that lets the dog know you're the one in charge. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm out running one morning, and this is the pace I always jogged at. I didn't want to risk breaking a sweat while I was out running. And I got in my zone, and you runners know what a zone is. That's where your thoughts just become so focused on one thing. And I'm thinking, glazed. I'm going to get it glazed. <laughs> Cinnamon roll and a buttery croissant. <laughs> From my zone, I get awoken by this vicious sound. <laughs> I stop running, and I turn around. Coming down the street, full bore with his teeth flared. Is this tiny little... <laughs> Three-legged dog, man. <laughs> Not can coming at me his motor just running. <laughs> well, maybe I'm a little warped, but I thought it was the funniest thing I'd ever seen. <laughs> I couldn't get freeze out. I was laughing too hard. So he, I'm pointing. I'm, I'm just spinning on myself. Just, then he got close enough to me, and I got nervous, and I found my voice. It just came out. I went freeze. The dog stopped. And then he tipped where the leg was missing. <laughs> Poor thing I could see in his little eyes. Ah, not again! <laughs> Started to walk away. I said, come on back, man. I'll get you Krispy Kreme. Come on. I got a 15-year-old son at home, hates that story. Told me one day I was making fun of a handicapped pet, and it ain't right. That's what he said to me. He ain't right, Daddy. Maybe not. It's funny. <laughs> That's our sensitive child. Everybody has one. If you have a teenager, applaud. Let me get a feel here. There it is, folks. I asked that question all over America. That's the response. Some kind of half-hearted, weak, feeble clap. <laughs> That's what teens do to you. They just suck the life force right out of you. <laughs> I believe teenagers are God's revenge on mankind. It's as if God said, well, let's see how they like it to create someone in their own image who denies their existence. <laughs> Nowhere in the Bible does it mention how old the devil was when he rejected God's authority. My guess would be 15. <laughs> yeah. I don't even know why they go to school at 15. Is there anything a 15-year-old doesn't already know? <laughs> Come on, parents, admit it. You've never said anything to your 15-year-old where he looked at you and went, oh, wow, I didn't know that. I make stuff up, and my 15-year-old goes, yeah. <laughs> I'm ready to call NASA and let him know what I got living with me. <laughs> no, you didn't hear me. I said, the kid knows everything. <laughs> and you might want to pick him up. I'm ready to send him to the moon without a suit. <laughs> this is a typical conversation I have with my 15-year-old. Last August, he comes to me. He says, you know, I think I'm old enough to buy my own school clothes. I said, you know, I think you're right. Then we stare at each other for a minute. <laughs> and he looks at me, he goes, what? And I said, what? He said, well, I need some money. <laughs> I'm sorry, I misunderstood. I thought you wanted to buy your own clothes, not pick them out. He said, whatever. Come on, parents, admit it. This is when you want to boink your kids right in the eyes. Not hard, just like Moe used to do to Larry. 
Say it again. Whatever. I like that. Do it again. Come here. So I give him money. I send him to the mall. He comes home. The deal is you got to show me what you bought. Modeling the jeans he bought. Have you seen the jeans kids are wearing? Walks out with 60 yards of denim hanging off his body. First time my wife washed him, she threw her back out, dragging him over to the dryer. And he comes out, his underwear's up here, his pants are sagging down there somewhere, and that penguin walk, they can't even walk, they just waddle. So he, so he waddles over to me and he goes, yo, 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 pops. He says, what do you think? Oh, I'm glad you asked. I think you and I are going back to the mall, Snoop Droopy Drawers. That's what I think. I'd ask him, what's with all the leg room? You're ripping off TV sets, you need that kind of leg room? He went for a quarter, his whole arm disappeared into his pant leg. Hey, what's that fuzzy thing? It's your little brother, let him out, will you? Terrible. And then you go to the mall with your 15-year-old. As a parent, you would think you haven't provided this child with one material thing in life. Everything their eyes are set upon in the mall, they need. Do you get tired of that word coming out of your child's mouth? I need, I need. If you have a small child, sit them down, teach them the difference between the words needs and wants. Two completely different meanings. Read them all one day, holds out these shoes. I need these shoes, I need them. So how much are they? And then he says, they're only. Yeah. Don't you love the word only? Especially coming from the unemployed. I just, I love that. With a straight face, he says, they're only a hundred bucks. For shoes he'll outgrow on the way out of the mall. So I said, back that tape up in your brain, boy. I'm gonna put some new information in there for you. First of all, unless your name is Michael Jordan, never in your lifetime will you need a hundred dollar pair of gym shoes. I have 40 bucks for your gym shoes. Now I can tell you what you need. 60 bucks. Yeah. They can help with their math as they go through the day, you know. They really get dramatic when the hormones kick in, don't they? You know, Why are you persecuting me, man? And he's a big kid. He's 6'2". He's about 225. He came home from football. That's what he says to me. Hey, just bench 250. I said, good, can you pick your socks up? <laughs> and I'll tell you, I'm just glad his voice finally changed. He had that crackling thing, you know, the prepubescent point, and then, hey, Dad, how are you? What's going on? <laughs> At 6'2", how do you keep a straight face during that phase of development? <laughs> Instead of getting mad at his brothers and yelling at him, we'd have farm animals showing up at our back door. Just <laughs> Standing in the hallway, get out of my room! <laughs> they're in my room, they're touching my stuff! Hey, dial it down, there's a goat back there asking about it. <laughs> oh, that's funny, Dad. Hey, hey, hey. put that one in your show. Hey, hey, hey. So I did. Get them ready for therapy young, that's what I say, folks. <laughs> Parents, your kids are going to therapy, they might as well have a reason. I've told my kids ever since they can write, every time they've perceived an injustice in our home, write it down, date it, I'll initial it. <laughs> they said, for what? So I said, when you're middle-aged and you're miserable and you wanna blame me, we'll just breeze right through the therapeutic process. What is it with 45-year-old men calling up their 70-year-old fathers and blaming them for stuff? What do they expect the old guy to do? Well, I got my answer ready if my kids call me up 20 years from now. All I'm gonna say is, oops. <laughs> what other answer is there? Two over? Come on, son, move back in. Me and mom will re-raise you. You know, we're a lot calmer since our strokes. I'll tell you, it's hard raising kids. Big controversy in America whether or not we should spank children. Well, I don't believe in it. 
I do it. <laughs> I'll tell you, I read something once. Punishment humiliates, discipline educates. I never once wanted to humiliate my children when I spanked them. I wanted to educate them. And the only thing they were going to learn when I spanked them, I was a bigger, stronger, tougher man than they were. I wasn't going to do it because I don't want to brag, but I can beat up any three-year-old boy in America. <laughs> Last time I spanked our three-year-old, six, eight months ago, I'll never forget this. I'm walking by my living room, like a lot of you men in this room, just walking by, trying to mind my own business. <laughs> Not even trying to make eye contact, because I don't want to get sucked into the vortex of my family's lives. I just <laughs> want to walk from one end of the house to the other. <laughs> I hear a noise, I look over, there's my two-and-a-half-year-old son on his knees trying to put a fork into a light socket. <laughs> what, are you supposed to chat with the child about that? Walk over, you know, son, I wouldn't do that. You know, electricity could hurt you. What's he going to say? Oh, thank you, Father. <laughs> you know, being only two, I was unaware of the dangerous side of electricity. <laughs> Why, I think I'll take a time out and ponder our discussion. <laughs> yeah. I, I did what some of you dads might have done. I just went, oh, no! <laughs> Primitive, but effective. <laughs> that was six months ago. To this day, the kid gingerly walks by our light sockets. <laughs> Heard him tell one of his little three-year-old buddies, that's bad. <laughs> I think he learned something. And a friend of mine said, aren't you worried that'll make him neurotic? <laughs> 20 years from now, his wife will ask him to plug in a lamp. <laughs> Shut up, we're getting clappers. <laughs> I have a 19-year-old uh, boy who's in the Army right now, and... Uh, that came about because January. Yeah, thank you. I'm, I'm, I'm proud of that decision that he made. And, and, uh, basically, last January, him and my wife were fighting daily, and I felt like a referee, and I sat him down, and I said, you can't live here anymore. He goes, what do you mean? And I said, well, I'll, I'll reiterate. <laughs> you can come for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. I love your company, but you can't live here anymore. Because I decided either you or your mother was leaving, and she kisses a whole lot better than you. So. <laughs> We've had many talks with the, uh, me and that boy, the oldest. Me and the boy were just, I remember when he was 14, my wife said, you have to talk to give him the talk, the talk, the talk. So I sat him down and I said, son, your mother and I were talking to some things you need to know about life. First thing is you gotta quit eating all the food in his house. <laughs> there are five of us here and every one of us feel like we're in competition for food with you. This is an American home, it's not the Serengeti, there'll be more food here tomorrow. And save some for your poor little brother. The kid's so skinny, he fell down a sewer grate yesterday. <laughs> Thank God he was wearing his bike helmet. He didn't fall all the way through. <laughs> Those bike helmets save lives, don't they? <laughs> Any man in this room over 40 knows when you were 13, if you would have showed up for a bike ride with a helmet on... You have needed the helmet to keep your head from caving in from the rocks your friends were pelting you with. Hey, Darkwad, what's with the hat? <laughs> hey, cut it out. <laughs> you, you dented my basket, man. But I got to tell you, the food thing in our home has gotten out of hand. My, my wife and I have gotten where we hide food in our bedroom to keep it from the kids. We got a stash of brownies and muffins and things next to our bed. So we go in the room late at night and lock the door. I'm sure the boys think we're doing something else. But we're, we're really just under the covers eating brownies and laughing a whole bunch. And you hit 40, it gets pretty pathetic. It really does. The brownies are here. Lock the door. <laughs> and right before the door closes from the living room, you hear the kids going, oh, that's disgusting. 
makes me sick. And it's sad. And if you do nothing with your children all week, eat dinner with them, for gosh sakes. They, the things that come out of their mouth. <laughs> We're eating dinner one night, my 15-year-old just goes, hey, I just thought of this. I go, what is it? He goes, I'll be driving next year. <laughs> that innocent remark has kept me awake for six weeks now. I can't. <laughs> Man, that's scary. It's even more frightening when you look out the living room window on a Saturday, you see him on his bicycle, pop a wheelie and plow right into your mailbox. <laughs> And he's got his learner's permit, so we let him drive us to church on Sunday. See, that way we can get all our prayer time in before we get there. Sometimes there's so many miracles, we just skip church, go right to the Cracker Barrel. That's the third tree that swerved out of the way of our car. And now that he's going to be getting his driver's license, he wants to get a vehicle, and he's looking at the Sunday paper for the pickup truck he's going to purchase. He's got $9 in a Folgers can in the bedroom. The last truck he looked at was $32,000. And I said to my wife, well, that explains his D in math. And I will not be the one to shatter that boy's dream. I'll I'll let the car dealer do it, man. I'll, I'll take him down there. Come on, boy, let's go pick you out a truck. Come on. Hey, don't forget the coffee can. And I suggested a used car, a really used car. You know, and he goes, oh, hey, I'll never drive a junk. Okay, paper boy. Cha-ching, 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 cha-ching. What's wrong with driving a junk? I'll tell you something, I've owned a lot of junks in my life. You want to drive stress-free, junks, man. Cave your quarter panels and cave your bump. Merging is never a problem. <laughs> Especially if your bumper's hanging on by a bungee cord, man. It's just, people go out of their way to let you slide right in. And it's only natural. You got a nice car, somebody hits it, it'll ruin your day. You got a junk and somebody hits it, man. It makes your day. <laughs> Guy that hitches on the you know, phone with his insurance agent, man, and you're on the phone with a travel agent. <laughs> Comes back, is that where I hit you? Oh no, I bought a home entertainment center with that dent. <laughs> you were kind enough to hit me in the Bahamas trip right over here, man. <laughs> yeah, who are you kidding? That repair check is not going for one repair. It's like finding a bag of cash on the side of the highway. <laughs> And one day he asked me what my first car was. Because he goes, well, well, what was your first car? I said, that's simple. It was a 67 Volkswagen Bug. And then he goes, what's a Bug? <laughs> Didn't know what a Bug was. And he goes, what do I have under the hood? A set of tire. <laughs> they knew how to make them, didn't they? That spare engine in the trunk in case the tire malfunctioned. <laughs> what a car. If you could get that thing doing 55 miles an hour, you turn the radio on, you drop down to 45. <laughs> Someone cuts you off, you get mad, you want to let them know by laying on the horn, you can forget that in a bug. It's like, hey! <laughs> it's a happy horn. It's so hard to hang on to your road rage when you got a horn like that. It's even harder when people are pulling over to quit laughing at you. That's <laughs> and who puts a defrosting system in for the bug? I mean, really, what is it? It's your breath in a rag. That's what it is. <laughs> and God forbid you get the heater work, and it'll burn every hair right off your ankle. It's like driving around with a flamethrower on the floorboard, man. <laughs> friend in the front seat. Shut it off, I'm on fire! The guy in the back seat, hey, throw me one of your pant legs, I'm freezing to death. <laughs> to the hospital, you got 30 degree burns and a frostbite victim. <laughs> and doctors know right away, Volkswagen heater. 
terrible cars. <laughs> and that was my first car. I'm older, wiser, you know. Don't want to brag, but now I'm driving a brand new Geo Metro. <laughs> well, the world of comedy has been good to me. Three whole cylinders of raw power. Car goes zero to 60, eventually. <laughs> My wife and I were driving along and we were having an argument and I wanted to make a point by stomping on the gas real hard. You know, let her know, oh, let her know I was mad. Hit that gas, boy. <laughs> the car actually coughed. I am not kidding. It just apparently got a little bit too much gas in its throat. You know, and it just went, oh, don't do that again. You know. Then you gotta wind it up to first. And then you shift. And my wife looks over and goes, ooh. <laughs> I had a real car when I got married, man. It was a 1966 Cadillac Coupe de Ville. Yeah. One day my kid asked me, what does Coupe de Ville mean? That's oh, a French word. It means boat. <laughs> yeah. Well, at least it had a horn in it. Changing lanes. <laughs> Huge car. Had a Geo in the trunk in case it broke down. <laughs> I love that Cadillac. They made them out of metal in 1966, man. Not like the Geo aluminum plastic. You know, sorry, I'm late, honey. Got knocked into a ditch by a big horse fly. <laughs> man, there were no airbags in a 66 Caddy because you didn't need them in 66. Hit something doing 40 miles an hour, got out of the car to see what it was you crushed. <laughs> Ran over a worm in my Geo and I messed up the suspension. <laughs> yeah, I'm driving along, it's like, <laughs> whoa. That had to be a night crawler. <laughs> Just lucky the sunroof was open. <laughs> I loved that Cadillac. Then one day my wife asked the fatal question, just sitting at the breakfast table, trying to mind my own business, not even making eye contact. Just... <laughs> she says, you know, I was thinking, Every man in his room knows when your wife says. You know, I was thinking, all she was thinking about is things you're gonna have to do. <laughs> she slides his paper at me, she says, how many miles per gallon does that Cadillac of yours get? I said, miles. <laughs> <laughs> Remember the engine man had a carburetor built by Hoover. I leave it running, the guy pumping gas, be going, better shut it off, I can't keep up. <laughs> The car started to die. I revved the engine. I went room and I sucked the attendant into the tank, man. <laughs> Driving around, I got gym shoes hanging out of my tank. I love that car. Then she says, get rid of it. That's what she said to me. Get rid of it. It eats gas, big gas guzzler. Why don't we just wad money up, throw it right out the window? <laughs> Wife tells you to get rid of something, you get rid of it. That's right. <laughs> Sounded like some small hands, didn't it? <laughs> I have only learned one thing in 20 years of marriage, and it's this. Happy wife, happy life. <laughs> if you're married, you already know that. And if you're not married, you better write it down not on some flimsy piece of paper. You go out and get a stone tablet and a chisel. <laughs> Be number 11 if you count them. <laughs> Bible says right in chapter two of Genesis, chapter two says right there, man will leave his father and mother. That's the verse I'm reading to my 15 year old every night. <laughs> it says here you're leaving Jack. Got to read all the way to the New Testament before he said you can come home again. 
Man will leave his father and mother, take a wife, and together they become one flesh. One, you don't get any closer to anyone that walks this planet than your wife. Ergo, happy wife, happy life. <laughs> my dad tried to tell me the same thing in his own way on my wedding day. He came to me and he said, son, I have only one piece of marital advice for you. Before you argue with your new wife, and believe me, you're going to argue with her. Before you do, I want you to stop and ask yourself two questions. Do you want to be right or do you want to be happy? <laughs> and then he broke down and sobbed right in front of me. <laughs> it was pathetic. And I had no idea what that man was talking about. 19 years later, I can tell you, I'm a happy, happy, happy man. I ain't been right in 12 years. Times I have to ask my wife, am I happy? Oh, you better believe you're happy, okay. <laughs> Just checking with your buttercup. <laughs> Call my buddies up, I can't go golfing, but I'm happy. <laughs> and don't get me wrong, we argue, my wife and I, and you have to argue in your marriage. If you don't argue in your marriage, it'll build up in your brain, and over time, it'll make you goofy. <laughs> yeah. Then you wind up like those babbling, mumbling couples you see in Florida. You know what I'm talking about. 50 plus years of marriage and they're walking down the street and the wife is up here. She's fine. You ever see the husband eight feet behind her? Whoa, that poor guy's all hunched over. He's vibrating. He's mumbling. Oh, he's telling me what to do. Well, I'm going to start telling you what to do. I'm a man. You can't tell me what to do. I'm a man. 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 He's just trying to win back all the arguments he's been giving away for 50 years. Guy was 6'3 when he got married. Now he's four foot one. Just leave a toilet seat up if I want to leave a toilet seat up. Tell me what to do. I hope you sit in the water every day. I don't care. That's when she turns around. What'd you say to me? I didn't say nothing to you. You gotta get it out, you gotta communicate. That's my wife's word, communication, communicate. But you have to learn how to communicate. When my wife and I were married five years, we went to a marriage counselor because we had to learn how to argue. We had to learn how to resolve conflict, that's what she said. <laughs> Apparently, shut up, what, shut up, what, shut up, what, shut up, what, is not a healthy discussion. <laughs> So we go to the marriage counselor and she asks my wife, why are you here? My wife gives a 20 minute dissertation on why we're there. And she looks at me and goes, why are you here? I said, because she told me to come. <laughs> you don't think you should be here? And I go, well, all we ever fight about is our lack of money. And I find it ironic that we spend $100 a week to learn how to do that. <laughs> my wife looked at me and said, shut up. I said, what? Here is $5,000 worth of information, folks, right here. Five grand, right here. I'll give it to you for free. What I learned in marriage counseling was whatever we're having an argument, what I have to say has no bearing on that argument whatsoever. Doesn't matter at all. It's what my wife hears me say that matters. And some of you guys know exactly what I'm talking about. How many times have you said something to your wife and you can see by her reaction she, you, she didn't hear what you said? Then you spend the next 45 minutes arguing about what you meant to say. I know what you meant by it. Oh, what do you mean I meant? I didn't mean that. I meant I, meant I said what I meant. I mean, I've learned. 20 years with this woman. I know better. I'll say something, see her reaction, and I'll go, oh, what'd you just hear me say? <laughs> then she'll tell me, and I'll go, you know what? I can work with that. Let's keep going. Here, I can... <laughs> Perhaps I can make the back nine. <laughs> took me two years of marriage to figure out my wife will never tell me to do anything around our house she wants me to do something she'll ask me a question from the question I'm supposed to stand there and figure out what it is she wants me to do <laughs> simple example say I leave a pair of my underwear in the middle of the bedroom floor which frosts my wife that's her favorite word someone will cut her off on the highway oh that frosts me <laughs> And if I'm not frosting her, I'm driving her up a wall. That's another one. Kids will come in. Where's mom? She's up the wall with frostbite. That's all I know. 
You won't believe what put her there, son. It was that pair of underwear in the middle of the bedroom floor. <laughs> Boy, you look at the most powerful pair of underwear known to mankind. They not only defy gravity, but they change temperatures. <laughs> so I leave my drawers in the middle of the room. Would my wife come to me and say to me, pick those up. That's three words, pick those up. Would she say them? No, because that would be simple, direct, right to the point. Then I, her husband, would know exactly what she wants from me. I'd be able to process the information, make a rational decision as to whether or not I could deliver her request. You see, at that point, we would be communicating at the highest human level through language. My wife will look at me, look at my underwear, and then ask me, are those yours? I sure hope they are, otherwise I got a few questions of my own. <laughs> what do you want? That is every man's question to the woman he loves. What do you want? Just tell me, what do you want? Quit talking in code and tell me what you want. If I have to tell you what I want, then it doesn't mean a whole lot to me now, does it? <laughs> Many a night I've walked around my house with a coat hanger strapped to my skull. <laughs> Boys are going, what are you doing, Dad? I'm trying to divine what your mother wants. <laughs> There's got to be a signal in his home somewhere. <laughs> so wrap me in tinfoil, it'll make me a better conduit. <laughs> And we have three boys, by the way. We have, I, I, I mentioned the 19-year-old. The, 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 the we have a 15-year-old, 1915, three. 1915, three. <laughs> now we ran out of brownies one night. <laughs> that won't happen again. We get it from Costco by the pallet now. <laughs> That's just what we needed, you know. Hard part was childproofing the home again. We just finally took a hammer, smashed everything of value to us because <laughs> the pressure was too much. Is that a Hummel? Run free, boys. <laughs> and I love my wife. She started menopause about a year and a half ago, so. There are nights I lie in bed and dream about the good old days of PMS, trust me. <laughs> I can't get my home cold enough for my wife. She's always on the phone with the air conditioning guy. It's broken again. I'm going, it's not broken. There's not enough free in the world for this woman. If there's a hole in the ozone, it is over the roof of my home, trust me. That's 48 degrees in my house. I'm hanging meat off my curtain rods. It's still not cold enough for her. And she wakes me up in the middle of the night to feel her night sweats. Is that necessary? <laughs> laying in bed, wake up, Jeffrey, feel this. It's disgusting. I'm just laying here. There's like a furnace in me or something. Boy, you're sure lucky you don't have to go through this. Well, you know I wouldn't if you'd quit waking me up. <laughs> I told my boys, watch out, man. Mom's going through some stuff. She says, what do you mean? Those nights you don't do your homework and she get mad and yell at you? And he said, yeah, it'll be a little different now. She might start crying and then stab you. So. <laughs> all I'm saying, you see your mother sweating, hide all the pencils. That's all I'm saying. I am amazed at how many people stop me out in the hallway and ask me, is your wife aware of the way you talk about her? No. <laughs> she thinks I'm a bricklayer. <laughs> well, honey, I'm off to Ohio to build another home. <laughs> well, God bless me with a wonderful woman. And uh, I gotta tell you, I was asked in an interview recently, uh, what is it I love most about my wife? And uh, that's one of those questions that sound on, on its surface a pretty uh, 
banal question and, and, and trite. And you give it some thought, and if every man would take the time to think about that, what is it you love most about her? Certainly after 20 years, um, I have to say that uh, this woman has seen just about every demon that I have to offer. I hope she's seen them all. And she still continues to lay next to me at night and, and profess her love for me. And uh, you can't buy that. That is a, an absolute gift of grace from, a, a, from a, 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 another human being. And uh, it wasn't always... Um, I, I remember somebody asked me, how does an atheist from the south side of Chicago wind up living in Nashville, Tennessee as a born-again Christian working churches? I was at a church last night in New Albany in, in a Nazarene from, from clubs like this and from Vegas casinos and from Atlantic City. And, and how do you wind up working churches? And uh, I got to tell you, 25 years ago when I started comedy in Chicago, I, this was the, la the last place I expected to ever be is in front of a church and uh, professing a faith in God, certainly. And what happened was I crawled into an Alcoholics Anonymous meeting 17 years ago, and all I wanted to do was stop drinking. That was it. That was my goal in life, was to stop drinking and try to be a civil human being to my family. I was not a nice man. Trust me. Let's just say I was an angry, bitter, jaded, cynical man, just not nice. And I was harder on my family than anybody. I wasn't nice to many of you people, but I was harder on my wife and kids. And they told me to pray to a God, and they said, pray to this God. And I said, I don't believe in God. And they said, well, find something in this universe that's bigger than you. And I got to tell you, as broken as I was and beat up as I was, that was the hardest thing I had to do was find something larger than me in the universe. Isn't that amazing? It's, it's, it's just how the human ego can be so large. And I could not get on my knees. I would not get on my knees and pray to anything. But God has his own plans. And I, I've loved the term, hound of heaven. I don't know if you're familiar with that. It's when God pursues his own. And he'll pursue you if he wants you. And the only, pay, the only motivator he has for you to get to look heavenly and get on your knees is pain. Unfortunately, that's his only way of getting your attention. And he took away everything that I thought I valued. Everything. And after seven or eight years on that journey, and I read a lot of books. I read all the self-help books I could get. I was... Uh, you know, reading Ayn Rand and, and, and trying, to, trying to get a hang on to something to make me a better human being. I really was. I was trying as hard as I could. I went to therapy, talked to people about my anger, my rage, my, all this stuff, and it just it wasn't working. I went through my whole life trying to feel like I belonged on this planet somewhere, and it just wasn't working. And God puts people in your lives. And trust me, if you're on a journey, pay attention to the people you come. Even the guy that hits you with his car is maybe there for a reason, you know? <laughs> And I met some interesting people when I look back on this. God put a man in my life. He was doing comedy for 100 bucks a week. The guy was worth, I don't know, four, five, six million dollars. Sold his business, made millions of dollars. Just wanted to go on the road and do comedy. He was 50-some years old. Wasn't a very good comic. <laughs> but he didn't have to be. I mean, he had all the money he ever needed. He's the only guy that we ever worked with that pulled into the jobs with a 450 SEL Mercedes. <laughs> I'm coming in on the Greyhound, you know. <laughs> yeah, how are you? I'm your headliner for the week. I make the big money. How are you? But God knows his own, man, and he knew I wouldn't talk to this man. I, I was a shallow, vacuous, empty vessel. I really was. And I didn't have anything to talk to this man about until I found out because of his wealth, he had access to some of the nicest golf courses in America. He was actually a member of Mirfield Village here, and uh, that's all I needed to hear. He was my new best friend. <laughs> What I didn't know about him was he was a fundamentalist Christian, and I didn't know that. And we're sitting on the fairway one day just talking. And we're talking about life. We're talking about this. We're talking about that. And then he brings up the Bible. And I said, ah, don't give me the Bible. I don't want to hear the Bible. And he says, what do you mean? And I said, I'm an atheist. I don't believe in that garbage. And he says, well, what is it about the Bible you don't think is true? And I said, I don't know. I never read it. And he said, well, you're not an atheist. You're a moron. <laughs> And I have to tell you, I would have hit him, except that I would have lost access to Muirfield Village. And I wasn't, I wasn't going to do that. And I asked him to explain himself. And he said, well, to be honest with you, a true atheist is not only a biblical scholar, but is scholarly in all the face of the earth. And after a long intellectual journey, has come to the conclusion that there is no God of the universe. You, on the other hand, want to circumvent the entire intellectual process and just come to the conclusion that there's no God. That's lazy and moronic. I didn't know what to say. <laughs> so at the end of the week, he said to me, there's a guy in Denton, Texas, a man named Tom Nelson. He said he teaches the Bible the way I think you would like it taught. And, he, and, and uh, I'd like to sign you up for some study tapes. And I said, will it cost me anything? And he said, nope. Uh, and I said, well, then knock yourself out. 
I'm not paying a nickel for that. And then he said, can I send you a Bible? And I said, hey, I've tried reading them. And believe me, I did. I opened them up in hotel rooms. I had read somewhere the Bible was the living, breathing word of God. I didn't get it. I'd open it up, look at it. Come on, you know, do something for me. I'd read. I couldn't get it. I didn't understand it. So he sends me the tape, sends me the Bible. Time goes by. And God implodes my life. He was imploding my life. My marriage was falling apart. I couldn't deal with my life. I, honestly, I tried. I, I, I'm telling you. If there was a book out there that I could have read that would have given me the tools that I needed to function in this life, I would have gotten it because I, I, had, I have stacks of them. And I couldn't figure out how to make my wife happy. That was all I wanted was to make her happy. I could, I, we quit fighting. If you think acrimony is bad in your marriage, wait till you get to apathy. Apathy is the absolute worst. It's not even a feeling. It's just this. We couldn't even deal with each other in the hallway. We would like sneak by each other and, and, and we're sleeping in the same bed and, and I'm reading and, and, and my back is to her. She's watching TV or the nights she would read, I'd watch TV. I mean, this is our life together. And somehow we're, tr we're getting through day to day, but I don't know how. And we're in a parking lot at Toys R Us and she says, you want a divorce? That's what she said to me. Do you want a divorce? We're buying toys for Christmas. And that's how she said it. As if you want to take out the trash. We've gotten to a point in our marriage where there's no emotion, there's no life, there's no nothing. We're soul dead people. And she looks at me and says, you want a divorce? This is the most life-altering decision a man and woman will ever make. You know, the culture wants to tell us that it doesn't mean anything. Just go to get, get your divorce. It's quick. It's painless. And move on with your life. It doesn't work that way. It is the most painful. When the Bible says you're one flesh, it is literally, that's what it feels like. And that's what we went through. We basically went through the pain of ripping our flesh apart. And this is what she asked me. You want to, and all I could think to say was, yeah, if that's what you want, I turned the car back down. That was how we decided to get a divorce. I mean, I look back on that time and I just go, wow. Who were those people? We now, we look at that and we go, who were those people? But God has to move you to a place, a place where you can pay attention. It has to all go away. You have to give it all up before he can work the restoring process. So I went home, and it says in the Bible, what Satan intends for evil, God will use for good. My biggest character flaw is procrastination. And Tammy had put it on me to fill out the divorce papers. <laughs> and it wasn't like, you know, we, we had anything to salvage. I figured, you know, I'll fill them out. But I got thank you cards from 1988 I haven't mailed, you know. So, <laughs> so I just went home, and I said, yeah, okay, we'll get around to it. And I had moved into the guest room, you know. And this is how we were living. I'd go on the road, do my comedy, and I'd come and I'd moved into the guest room. And we, you know, we're raising these kids, and, and we're, we're existing. And as God would have it, he moves this woman into my wife's life. My wife shows dogs for a living, and she's at a dog show, and this battered woman shows up. She's just beat, and Tammy says, you can't go back to that man. And, and, and she says, I got nowhere else to go. And Tammy says, well, we have a guest room. She gives the woman my room, and i got to move back into the bedroom. And now we have a chance. This is an opportunity now. We have given up. We have let go of everything, and now we're going to talk. And believe me, it was difficult. I, there was a point after a couple nights I looked at her. She wouldn't even look at me. I was talking to her back for two days. I mean, you know, I'd say something, and she, she, I finally walked over across the room and put my hands on her shoulders, and she flinches, and she just, she says, no, I, don't, I can't. I said, will you look at me? She said, I can't. How do you get to a place in your life with someone that you love? I know I love this woman. I know I do. I had therapists tell me I love her. For God's <laughs> sakes, I love this woman. And we're at a point we can't even look at each other. She says, I can't. I just, I, Jeff, I just fill out those papers. I just want to get this, I want to get it over with. And that was what I, I just, okay. I went out in the kitchen and, you know, filling them out. And there was nothing to give away. We lost it all in a bankruptcy. I mean, we, we lost it all, everything. And we're on our way to divorce court to file the papers. A few days later, whatever, we're filing the papers. We're 10 minutes from filing the papers in Maricopa County to end this part of our lives. And that little voice, that little quiet voice that God puts in us. And sometimes you've got to shut the TVs off and the stereos off and all these other things off to hear it. But it said something to my wife. I don't know what it said. But all I know is she said, pull the car over. And I said, for what? She says, I've I, I got to rethink this. This is a two-year process, man. Two years of letting go of this woman. And I'm telling you, it was, it was, I wouldn't wish this on anybody. 
I don't know if any man in this room knows what it's like to wake up in the morning with so, so much anxiety. As soon as your eyes pop open, it's just like the world caves in on you. And you walk around, and you just want to know where it's coming from. I said it would have been so much easier if I woke up in the morning and some man just started beating me with a stick. At least I knew where the pain was coming from. And people would go, why are you so miserable? Because he keeps hitting me. <laughs> My wife would ask me, why are you so miserable? And I'd go, I don't know. I don't know. I don't want to be. I don't know. She goes, why can't you enjoy your job? I go, I don't know. What's the point? What is the point? Don't you care? There's a point? There's a purpose to this? And my wife would go, no. I just want my family. Ten minutes from divorce court, she says, pull over. I can't. I, I want to rethink it. And I said, babe, if you're, you're in this, you're in for the long haul, I can't, I can't be playing this anymore. I can't. Let's just cut it and go. She says, no, Jeff, I don't know why. I don't know why. We know why now, but we didn't know then why. But anyway, we go home. Eight months goes by. It's not getting much better. It's getting a little better. It's not much. She comes to me, and she says, I'm going to Ohio with the kids. And I said, we can't afford to go to Ohio. She says, you're not invited. And I said, well, how are you going to get there? She says, my father's going to pay for the trip. We're taking the boys, and we're going for the summer. And she says, while I'm gone, you're going to get your life together. I'm coming up on my 40th birthday, and I'm telling you, I'm, I'm just, I have no clue. I have no idea. I went to Domino's Pizza to get a job to deliver pizzas, and they wouldn't hire me. You want to talk about humbling. Be a 40-year-old man with a mortgage and kids and wife, and you figure, I'm lowering myself to get this job. And the kid looks at my application and says, comedian, that's it? That's the only job you've had? And I said, yeah. He said, well, what do you want me to do with this? And I said, you know, we're not splitting atoms. We're delivering pizzas, for God's sake. <laughs> Apparently, my interviewing skills had suffered over the years, too. <laughs> But it was like, my God, don't make me beg for a job p delivering pizzas. I go home and tell my wife I'm unemployable. I can't take it anymore. You know, anyway, she packs the kids up. And before she leaves, she grabs these tapes that I've been collecting. And she puts them in a pile. And she says, you either listen to these things or I'm throwing them out. And again, I had no reason to say, keep them. I hadn't listened. I hadn't even thought about them in a year and a half, two years. I don't know. I'd just been collecting them and throwing them on the different houses. And that little voice, the little quiet voice says, yeah, leave them there. Leave them in the, on the floor. I'll, I'll get to them. I don't care, you know. And a few days goes by, I'm walking by the tapes, and I said, you know, little voice, says, open one up. And I said, okay, I start to walk, another voice says, well, for what? There's nothing in there for it. Nothing. And then that starts, that whole dialogue of what's in there, I want to get it, I want to get it. When I read about demonic realms and angelic realms in, in the Bible, I, I went right back to this moment in my life. Because it was a struggle to get in there, because something knew what was in them things. And I ripped one open, I finally got over that after five minutes. You know, I'm 40 years old, and I'm having an argument with myself in the front room. I used to say that's why I got drunk in the morning, it was crowd control. You know. <laughs> But I just, <laughs> maybe I am nuts. I don't know. But I'm trying to get into this. I rip one open. I throw them on the floor. And I, and I, and I, and I go there. You know, there's a couple tapes. And I go, all right, what, what am I going to do now? Pick one up, Ecclesiastes. And I couldn't even pronounce it. It was Ecclesiastes or whatever. I said, I don't know what this is. I got to get that Bible. Where's that Bible? Oh, it's in the junk drawer. And that's where I left it. So I pulled the Bible out of the junk drawer. And I put the tape into the machine. And I started listening to this pastor from Denton, Texas, talk about what Solomon, Solomon, this, this wise old man, 78 years old, wrote Ecclesiastes at the end of his life about life on earth. And it starts out with meaningless, meaningless. It's all meaningless. That got my attention. Boom. Because that's the way I felt. I couldn't find anything worth meaning in this, in this earth. Really, nothing. Not in career, not my wife, not my kids, not my cars, not my home. Nothing. And he starts talking about it. And basically Solomon's conclusions were that life without God will have no meaning. And I didn't understand that. And as he began to explain about the creation, in order to enjoy the creation, you have to know the one that created it. And, and, and if happiness were an act of will, we'd all be happy. Because that's basically what we want out of life. Everybody wants to be happy. You ask them. So if it was an act of human will, why aren't we happy? We're the most medicated species on the planet. We really are. And what it is, what I found out, what he said was something has to come outside of us, inside of us, change our hearts, and then work its way out through the, through the act of service to others. And I was blown away. For the first time in my life, I heard something that made sense. And I believe it was because that day God chose to turn it on inside me. That was the light switch. Bam, it went on. And I was like, wow, this, this is it. This is what I was looking for. I wanted purpose. I wanted some reason to get up in the morning and put one foot in front of the other. And then I said, without God, I have no. Well, how do I get God? So I opened another tape, put another tape, another tape, another tape, because I'm a compulsive, addictive personality. I was just, I mean, I'm not kidding you, man. And I'm making notes in my Bible, and I'm going like, man, this is the greatest stuff I've ever heard. At one point, I wanted to run on my lawn and hold the Bible up. Have you read this thing? Wow, what a book. Man, this is amazing. 
And I don't know why, I don't know why it was 40 years or whatever. I mean, this was a 13-year journey up to this point. I'm not telling you, this did not come overnight. I didn't get the road to Damascus epiphany that Paul got. I'm telling you, man, I sought this. And I went on and I laid in fetal position. I used to go to the desert and scream up at God, all right, if you're up there, show me, you know. And I mean, it was today, that day, bam. And I'm listening to these tapes, and then he gets to the Jesus that he knew. The one he says, he says, he says he was, he was at a prison. And I'll never forget this line. I love this line. He was at a prison doing a sermon, and he said to the prisoners in this prison, he said, I would not walk across this stage to tell you about my religion, Christianity, but I will crawl on my hands and knees through broken glass to hell and back to tell you about the love of my Savior, Jesus Christ. And I heard that as a man. As a man, I said, that's what I want. I want something. I want something that I want to die for. I believe this, that a man is not, and I'm talking about a man, I'm not a woman, but I'm a man, and I said a man is not fully alive till he has something in his life that he's willing to give his life up for. And I'd like to think I'd give my life up for my wife and kids, but I'll tell you something, I'll give my life up now for my Savior and my right to profess this faith because I'm telling you, it transformed my life. So anyway, to make a long story short, <laughs> I know that's hard to do at this point. The gift is the peace. The gift is the peace. I went to this man's home in, in Dallas, Texas, and this is like two years into it. And if you're into discipling people, this is the way you disciple people. This man called me on and off for two years. He had no business talking to me. We were not in the same economic bracket. We were not same, in the same intellectual bracket. We were not educated the same way. We had nothing in common other than the fact that he was discipling me, and he would call me up and just go, how you doing? How you doing? Never once did he say, did you open those tapes I've been sending you? Have you opened the Bible I sent you? Did you, did you, did you, did you? All I'd say is, how are you and Tammy doing? How are you guys doing? We know you're having trouble. Are you doing all right? And then he'd close every conversation we ever had with, you know, Carol and I pray for you every night. We pray for you every night. And it never meant, it meant nothing to me. It meant absolutely nothing to me. Big deal. Yeah, okay, thanks, Phil. That's the pre I appreciate it, thanks. I look back on that right now, and I think, what a gift. What a gift from a total, I mean, you can't buy that. You can't will that. That is a gift for a man to care enough about me and my wife, two total strangers, to say every night at dinner, hey, creator, could you be with Jeff and Tammy, man? They need your help. You know? Wow. It means something. It's got to mean something. It has to. Otherwise, it's just it, it's nothing. What's the point? So he, if you know what the, the gift is to peace, that's the gift. You turn on the TV and they'll tell you it's the money, the, the, the thing. And God has restored everything that he took, everything, everything. We, we, you know, we've got a car again. We've got furniture again. We got, I mean, you know, they, they sound like basics, but there's a, such a deep appreciation for this stuff now. I mean, there's such a deeper appreciation because we now know where it comes from. And it's just... There's life in our home. I, I tell audiences all the time, we're fighting again. I think that's wonderful, don't you? I mean, we're, <laughs> we argue. I got to tell you this. We were eating breakfast a while back, and uh, this is how it's, and I'm minding my own business. I want you to know. I'm sitting at the breakfast table, minding my own business. I might have been whistling that morning, would explain why I didn't hear her ticking on the other side of the table. <laughs> all I wanted to do was butter a waffle. That's it, just butter my waffle. Some of you guys know what I'm talking about. No family business, no talk, no nothing. Butter, a waffle. So it's sweetheart, could you pass me the butter knife? <laughs> now I'm thinking something must be bothering Buttercup. So I asked, some on your mind? She says, I'm fat. Every man in this room knows you can't respond to that. A twitch of the eye is going to get you killed right here. <laughs> you ever hear your wife say she's fat, you better become mannequin man. <laughs> you don't move a muscle and you don't say anything. <laughs> Worst thing you could say is, well, maybe if you laid off the brownies for breakfast. <laughs> and you don't want to mention ice cream's not supposed to go in the slim fast. 
Can you just keep your mouth shut, let her finish her sentence, dig the knife out of the wall, butter the wall. <laughs> then she says, we're joining a health club. Did you hear what I said? I think I heard you say, you're fat and we're joining a health club. <laughs> oh, believe it or not, that was the wrong answer. <laughs> of course we joined a health club. Happy wife, happy life. And if there are two people that inhabit this rock that should have never purchased a health club membership, it is my wife and I. Talk about lazy. We've woken the kids up to get the remote for the TV. We've had an exercise bike in our bedroom for 11 years. It's got a mile and a half on it. Most of that was put on the bike by the baby, sitting on the floor, spinning the puppy. And last month, she made a cellular phone call from our driveway to me in the house. She asked me to bring her her purse. What do you do with that call? You know, Hello, get my purse. Where are you at? I'm in the driveway. Going to the health club and I need my ID. How lazy are you? Hey, go get your mother's purse and bring it to her. Thank you all very much. God bless you. Thank you.